Hi everyone. In this video, I am going to discuss and explain some of the ideas in Chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, the Bhagavad Gita is a very old piece of literature from ancient India. We're talking over 2,000 years old, and it is central to the Hindu religion. To give you a little bit of background on the Bhagavad Gita, um, the story, which starts in Chapter 1, is about uh, a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. Arjuna is a commander of an army, and there, he's about to go to battle. The other army is on the other side of the battlefield, and Krishna is his chariot driver. So Arjuna asks Krishna to take him in between the two armies so that he can see the other side, and he expresses in the beginning of this chapter his doubts about fighting this war. Turns out we find out later that Krishna is actually the god Vishnu, and so the uh, teachings that Krishna gives to Arjuna in this chapter and in the subsequent chapters are the teachings of the god Vishnu to Arjuna. So let's go ahead and jump in here. Chapter 2, it's entitled here, Transcendental Knowledge. So Sanjaya, who's the narrator of the Bhagavad Gita, says, Lord Krishna spoke these words to Arjuna, whose eyes were tearful and downcast, and who was overwhelmed with compassion and despair. So why is he overwhelmed with compassion and despair? Because he doesn't want to fight this war. He sees on the other side uh, people that he knows, family members, teachers, and Krishna says to him at that moment, do not become a coward, O Arjuna, because it does not befit you. Shake off this weakness of your heart and get up for the battle, O Arjuna. So he's basically telling him, Stand up and fight. Arjuna replies, How shall I strike Bhishma and Drona, who are worthy of my worship, with arrows in battle, O Krishna? Arjuna continues, My heart is overcome by the weakness of pity, and my mind is confused about Dharma. I request you to tell me decisively what is better for me. I am your disciple. Teach me who has taken refuge in you. So dharma here, you can roll, uh, scroll over that word to see a full definition. But dharma is one's moral obligation. And in this context in particular, in the Hindu religion, dharma means one's obligation, uh, what the obligation one has on the basis of the caste you're a part of. So Arjuna is a member of the Kshatriya caste which is the caste of warriors. So he has a, a certain duty that he needs to fulfill in accordance with his dharma. So Krishna starts off his lesson here. He says, the wise grieve neither for the living nor the dead. There was never a time when I, you, or these kings did not exist, nor shall we ever cease to exist in the future. Just as the Atman acquires a childhood body a youth body and an old age body during this life. Similarly, Atman acquires another body after death. So let's stop here and talk about Atman. The Atman is the self. You might call it the soul that you have inside of you. So, so Krishna's philosophy here is that we have a soul or a self. Turns out later we'll find out that the Atman is Brahman in the word the Brahman means God. So basically we have God within us, um, but I won't get too much into that now. But here he's saying that the Atman has a body, it acquires a body, and it, and it acquires a new body after death. So what we have here is the beginnings of this teaching of reincarnation. Now he explains a bit further the contacts of the senses with the sense objects gives rise to the feelings of heat and cold and pain and pleasure. They are transitory and impermanent. So what he's talking about here is the external world, the world of change, the world of becoming. So he's saying to Arjuna, don't be distracted by this world of change and becoming. These things are impermanent things. Rather, he continues, there is no non-existence of the sat, or the atman, and no existence of the asat, or that thing that doesn't exist, or the non-self. So what he's saying here, sat is one of the attributes of God, or of the atman. We might even call sat, there's a definition down below here, we might even call sat 
being. So we have being here and above in the green highlight, we might call it becoming. We have change and we have being. What is permanent is the self. So if the self or Atman is permanent and the body is impermanent and the external world is, and all of its changing things are impermanent, then what follows? Well, when you kill someone on the battlefield, you're not really killing anyone at all. The self survives. So he says down below, this is, uh, this is Krishna speaking, the one who thinks that Atman is a slayer and the one who thinks that Atman is slain, both are ignorant because Atman neither slays nor is slain. The Atman is neither born nor does it die at any time, nor having been, it will cease to exist again. It is unborn, eternal, permanent, and primeval. The Atman is not destroyed when the body is destroyed. Oh, Arjuna, how can a person who knows that the Atman is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and imperishable kill anyone or cause anyone to be killed? Just as a person puts on new garments after discarding the old ones, similarly, Atman acquires new bodies after casting away the old bodies. So in verse 21 here, he's not saying uh, you shouldn't kill. He's actually saying uh, it's actually your duty, Arjuna, to kill in a battle in this so-called just war, you should go ahead and kill because you're not really killing anybody. You're just killing their bodies. They will be reincarnated. So don't sweat it. Okay, so he now talks about Arjuna's duty as a warrior. He says, considering also your duty as a warrior, you should not waver because there is nothing more auspicious for a warrior than a righteous war or a just war. So the assumption here is that, that Arjuna is fighting a good war. He's justified in going to battle. And uh, he continues, if you will not fight this righteous war, then you will fail in your duty and lose your reputation and incur, incur sin. So now it gets more philosophical. He says, the wisdom of Samkhya, or the knowledge of the self, has been imparted to you. This is what he was talking about earlier with being and becoming. Now listen to the wisdom of karma yoga, endowed with which you will free yourself from the bondage of karma. Now he's going to explain uh, the karma yoga, or action yoga, the way of action, uh, and what that means. So karma yoga, here's a definition for you down below, the karma yoga is the way of selfless action. It means you're supposed to, in order to find salvation or liberation in the Hindu religion, you follow this path by practicing your duty, doing your duty without any concern about what the consequences might be. So this might also be called uh, the way of detachment. Scrolling down, he says, this is Krishna speaking, you have adhikara over your respective duty only, but no control or claim over the results. The fruits of work should not be your motive. Adhikara is control. So you have control over your duty, your action, but no control over the results. So don't worry about the results. He continues, do your duty to the best of your ability, O Arjuna, with your mind attached to the Lord, abandoning worry and attachment to the results and remaining calm in both success and failure. The equanimity of mind is called karma yoga. So just do what you're supposed to do, Arjuna. Do the right thing. Do your caste duty. Be a good soldier and uh, don't worry about what comes of it. So Arjuna says in reply, O oh Krishna, what is the mark of a person whose prajna or pradnya is steady and merged in superconscious state? So the definition here for prajna is uh, wisdom. And there's a longer definition down below. So Krishna replies, when one is completely free from all desires of the mind and is satisfied in the self by the joy of self, then one is called a person of steady prajna, or a wise person. He continues, a person whose mind is unperturbed by sorrow, who does not crave pleasures, and who is free from attachment, fear, and anger, such a person is called a, a sage of steady prajna. Those who are not attached to anything, who are neither elated by getting desired results nor troubled by undesired results, 
their prajna is deemed steady. When one can completely withdraw or restrain the senses from the sense objects as a tortoise withdraws its limbs into the shell, then the prajna of such a person is considered steady. So you get this picture of a wise person who's um, unaffected by all the things going on around them. They don't get overly emotional. They're not, they don't have strong desires or cravings. Or at least they don't give in to them. They're self-controlled. So it's, it's sort of this negative picture, but what is the positive picture? What is a, what is a wise, wise person doing? And I think he explains that here. He says, having brought the senses under control, one should fix one's mind on the self. So this self is the Atman, or we find out later, God himself. Uh, one's prajna becomes steady whose senses are under control. All right, so I hope that gives you, helps you see the picture of reality that Krishna uh, paints for Arjuna. You see the picture of reality, the philosophy of Hinduism.